In our last series, we discussed how group decision-making is like building a house. If decisions are based on faulty conclusions, the outcome is compromised. A common source of faulty conclusions are logical fallacies, which occur when a person supports a position with misleading, flawed, or outright false argumentation. In our last video, we discussed the ad hominem and two quo quo fallacies, which occur when a person defends his or her position by either attacking the character of an opponent or accusing the opponent of doing the same thing. As an example, we introduce Bob, who committed the ad hominem and two quo quo fallacies when he argued, Billy said her managers don't have time for additional observations, but she just added a new inventory report that takes even more time. Plus, I heard she does street racing on Saturday nights. This is obviously not a person who cares about safety. Neither point is helpful or relevant to the decision at hand. In this response, Bob defends his position by first alleging that if Billy can add to her supervisor's plate with the new inventory report, then Bob should be able to add to their responsibilities as well. Further, he supports his position that increased observations are needed by attacking Billy's character, alleging she is an unsafe person as evidenced by her street racing. We ask how Bob could reframe his position and if the inventory report example could still be appropriately discussed. In this example, Bob should avoid negatively characterizing Billy as unsafe, especially by using irrelevant examples like her alleged hobbies. Likewise, it does not support his position that Billy also added responsibilities to their manager's workloads. However, as hinted last week, he can bring up the inventory report, but only as it directly relates to the safety observations. In other words, Bob should not say, I should get to add additional workload to our managers because you added additional workload to our managers. But it would be perfectly fair to say, the reports are not as important as safety observations. Their time would be better spent increasing the safety observations and discontinuing the report. In the first instance, Bob is arguing he should get to do something because Billy did it. In the second, he is saying one task should be prioritized over the other. This week, we will discuss two new fallacies that are also very common in the workplace. Before we name these fallacies, see if you can spot them in Jane and Jack's discussion about whether to purchase software for their company. To support his position that the company should not purchase the software, Jack states, But this is how we've always done it. We've used the same program since 1998. We have no need for new software. Yes, but all of our major competitors are using this software. Therefore, we should too. Can you identify the fallacies implicated? If you guessed the appeal to tradition and bandwagon fallacies, you would be correct. The appeal to tradition fallacy occurs when one person argues for a position based on conformity to past practice. In other words, it's the way we have always done it. While a method used in the past may have worked in the past, it isn't always the best choice moving forward. Learning from the past is good practice, but being blindly tethered to the past is not. The bandwagon fallacy occurs when a person argues his or her position is correct because it is the way others are addressing the issue. Again, while this may be helpful to a limited extent, this argument should be approached with caution. As one, others may be wrong in how they are addressing the issue. Two, others may be right, but it is not the right decision for everyone. In other words, it may work for group A, but not group B. And three, when a company or a person does things the way everyone else does, it becomes difficult to stand out or innovate. In our example, Jane defends her software purchase by pointing to what their competitors are doing. Again, while this may be right for their competitors, it may not be the right decision for Jane's company. Further, it reduces the company's chance of standing out among their competitors if they do things the way everyone else is. Jack's argument about the way we've always done it is equally not helpful, particularly with software. Past practice does not prove the best choice for the company moving forward. So how could Jane and Jack reframe their arguments? Jane can still point to her competitors using the product, but should be careful to accompany that claim with support that, one, it is still the right decision for her company, and two, address the concern that they will not be able to compete against their competitors if they are all using the exact same software. For example, she could state that simple customizable features in the software still allow for distinctive usage of the product and ultimately provide a competitive edge. For example, Jane could state, 
BigCo and HugeCo both use this software as well. They have similar revenues and margins as ours, as well as a similar staff size. They were able to complete implementation without overwhelming their teams or their bottom lines. Further, the software allows us to customize the user interface. Therefore, although the software is the same, we can make our customer user experience superior to theirs while using the same platform. Likewise, if Jack is going to bring up that their current program is how it has always been, he should accompany that statement with support for why it is best to continue with this practice. Now, Jack's argument isn't merely that his company should continue to do what they've always done. Rather, it is a support for why his company should continue to do what they've always done. In other words, not past practice alone, but past practice plus reasons why to continue past practice. Now that we're familiar with the bandwagon and appeal to tradition fallacies, Let's turn to our other team discussion, whether to increase safety observations at Bob and Billy's facility. The number of observations I'm proposing is the same number of observations being performed by Big Shipping Inc. Billy replies, Well, that's just not how we do things around here. We've always just done two safety observations a week. How have Bob and Billy committed the bandwagon and appeal to tradition fallacies? How can they still discuss past practices and the practices of their competitors without committing a fallacy. In our next episode, we will hear how Bob and Billy can avoid the bandwagon and appeal to tradition fallacies. Then we will discuss two additional fallacies, the emotional and personal incredulity fallacies. Until next time, build well. 